But I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Acts and chapter 1. This is the third message in the book of Acts, a series that we're going to be doing as we go through the book of Acts. And uh, I want to talk to you about an individual that you've heard about, and that is Judas Iscariot. Everybody's heard that name. And was he saved or was he lost? Because after all, he was one of the disciples. And as a disciple, well, he should have uh, no doubt known the Lord. And if he was saved, where did he go when he died? So it does get very interesting. And I want you to look there in Acts chapter 1 and verse 12. Then returned they into Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey, a little over half a mile. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room and were abode Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James and the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. Now, totally, there's about 120 there in the upper room. And then it says they had to make a decision. Well, uh, in those days it says Peter. Because, you know, there were 12 disciples and now there's only 11 because uh, Judas is now dead. So they took those scriptures that were in the Old Testament that somebody else would take their place. Now there's pros and cons on both sides about whether or not uh, he should have done it or he shouldn't have done it. I don't really care. I believe that the person that they chose... Uh, was never heard of again. But then a lot of the disciples were not heard of again. And that um, we have later on the great Apostle Paul that we know was an apostle and I believe numbered with the original. So anyway, but be that as it may, it's not going to change the fact that one had died. What happened to him? And why did he die? And was he saved and then lost? Because there's many people that believe that he was a saved man and now he goes to hell. And he became a lost man. But it talks about how he had betrayed the Lord, you know, and sold him for some money. And later on it was used to buy some a field of blood where they had a cemetery and Anyway, things weren't looking too good. So look down there in verse 23. And they appointed two Joseph called Barsabas, and who was surnamed Justice and uh, Matthias or Matthias. And they prayed and said, Lord, uh, which knoweth the hearts of all men, choose whether of these two thou shalt have chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he may go to his own place. So is his own place a different place than where everybody else was going to go to? And they cast their lots, and it fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Now, the scripture here doesn't say whether it was right or wrong. Just, this is what happened. Uh, the book of Acts is a historical book. Uh, it doesn't tell us what to do or not to do. It just tells you this is what happened. If you take the book of Acts out of the Bible, and you just finish with the Gospels, and then you start with Romans and it, there's a whole gap in there of knowledge. Well, what happened? So the book of Acts is a bridge between uh, the Gospels and the doctrinal books. So it's very, very important. And the book of Acts is a book of action. As you study the book of Acts, you'll find out when the Holy Spirit came upon them, they were to be witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and now the most parts of the earth. And one story after the other is a soul-winning story. The soul-winning adventures all the way through. So as you read it, you find out what Christ meant when he told his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, the book of Acts tells you what he meant because they understood and they did it. And so if you want to know what serving the Lord's all about, then you study the book of Acts. It is a book of action that helps you to see and understand our responsibility. Now, in the very beginning, it says there 
And I want you to see this. Look in verse 18. Now this man, talking about Judas, purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and fallen headlong, he burst asunder in the mist, and all his bowels gushed out. It was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, inasmuch as that field is called in their proper tongue, a seldomah, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and no man dwell therein, and as bishopric or his officer service, uh, let another take. So they wanted to know what they should do. So they kind of like drew straws and cast lots, and uh, they got a man that nobody ever hears about again. Uh, he could have been numbered with them. I, I, don't, I don't know. And sometime when Scripture's not enough light on it, then it's better leave it alone. But what about the man? I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Mark chapter 3. Mark and chapter 3. Now, do stay with me because this is very important because if he was saved and was lost, how do you know you can't be saved today and lost tomorrow? And if you can be lost, you can't say absolutely that you're no, you know you're going to go to heaven because you might do the same thing he did. What? Betrayed the Lord. Isn't it possible? But anyway, here in the book of Mark chapter 3, I want you to look there in verse 13. And he goeth up into a mountain, and calleth unto him whom he would. And they came unto him, and he ordained twelve, that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses, and to cast out devils. And Simon, he surnamed Peter. And he goes down through and names all these various individuals. And then in verse 19 he says, And Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, and they went into a house. So he chose him. Well, did he only choose believers, or it didn't make any difference? Uh, did he choose them to be saved, or he just chose them to do a job? He wanted them to do this and go there and do this and do that, and uh, therefore he gave them the power to do these various things. And it had absolutely nothing to do with him being saved. It was just a responsibility. Remember, you can be a disciple of Christ and not saved. And you can be saved and not a disciple. You see, you can follow the teachings of Christ and never trust Him as your Savior. And you may just trust Him as your Savior and never serve Him and still be saved. So you see, the key is trust Him as your Savior <clears throat> and then as a child of God, serve the Lord. That would be the ideal. But what about this man? What about him? And so I want you to look in your Bible to Luke chapter 22. you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke ch chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, look there in verse 1. In verse 1, it says, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priest... And scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and the captains how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and coveted to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him and unto them in the absence of the multitude. So they made a deal. You pay me and I'll betray Christ to you and I'll show you how you can catch him and where he's going to be. Because he'd already done walk with him. But it makes the statement here in verse 3, Then entered Satan into Judas. Now the Bible does talk about uh, you know, if you trust Christ as your Savior, if I trust Christ as my Savior, the Holy Spirit indwells me, and He'll never leave me and never forsake me. Well, then I don't have to worry about Satan indwelling me because Satan cannot indwell me. I cannot be indwelt by evil spirits if I have the Holy Spirit living within me. So I never have tried to, in all of my ministry, go in all the world and try to cast out devils out of people. All I do is just try to get them to trust Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit, and dwell them, case solved. Now, you may be de demon-oppressed, but not demon-possessed. There are lost people that, yes, 
Demons are real. If it wasn't real, you might as well take out most of the miracles in the Bible because it dealt with that subject of Jesus Christ, either healing somebody, casting out a, a dumb spirit, and uh, whatever. So it, the Bible is full of those things. But here's a man who walked with the Lord for three and a half years, who saw everything that he did. He was able to even do the miracles and so forth because God gave him the power they could do it. And he heard all the preaching. He heard all these sermons. He had to even hear John 3.16 because John 3.16 is not the end of Christ's ministry. John 3.16 was at the beginning of Christ's ministry. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. That's at the beginning of Christ's ministry. John chapter 3. He had to hear all of these things. And yet, I do not believe he ever trusted in the Messiah. He heard, he saw, he walked, but never believed it. And it's just like you can come to church. Isn't that a Christian thing to do? Reading your Bible, isn't that a Christian thing to do? Praying, isn't that a Christian thing to do? But just because you do those things, does that guarantee you're going to heaven? No, you're not going to heaven just because you do those things. You see, if you never trust Christ as your Savior, you still don't go, even though you do all those Christian things. And you may live right. You may pay all your bills. You may work hard. Moral individual. But if you never trust Christ, you still don't go to heaven. So even though he saw, he heard, he was with it, for three and a half years he never believed on the Lord. You say, can you prove that? I'm going to do my dead level best to prove what I'm saying is true. Look in John chapter 12, the gospel of John and chapter 12. John chapter 12 and look in verse 2. In verse 2 says, There they made him a supper. Martha served. Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, so you know who he is. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Now, isn't that a wonderful spiritual thing to say? He was concerned about the poor. You know, there's a lot of people talk about the poor, the poor, the poor. Christ says the poor you'll always have with you. Some people, believe it or not, are poor by choice. Well, I could get sidetracked here very easily right now. But I'm not, but I'm not. I'm going to stick with my context here. So he says, this, month, th this perfume is so expensive, we could have sold it and given it to the poor. Look at the next verse. This he said because he was spiritual, because he was so godly. No, that's not what he says. He says in verse 6, this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and had the bag, and he was the secretary, financial secretary for the group. And he bare what was put therein. You say, what does that mean? It means that what was put therein, he took there out. <laughs> he was a thief. Now, do you think that Jesus knew he was a thief? I mean, if Jesus is God, then he knew all about Judas. And knew that Judas was a a phony baloney from the very beginning. Now look what else he says. When he makes this statement here, it goes down and talks about all this. But look in verse 18. For this cause, the people also met him. For they that heard that he had done this miracles, the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how he, ye prevail nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. Everybody was going after him. He had made a triumphant entry into the city. And uh, how he did it, everybody was honoring and worshiping who he And think for a moment. 
Here is Judas who was there, who saw all of this, and didn't believe that he was who he claimed to be. Now, he gets to the place where that question is going to be asked. So look there in John chapter 13. John chapter 13. In John chapter 13, and look there in verse 1. Now, behold, the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Remember that statement, because I'm going to refer to that statement a little bit later. In verse 2, supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he was come from God and went to God. Now, he knew everything that was going on. He knew he came from God. He knew who he was, and he knew Judas, and he knew what Judas was going to do. It was not a secret. It wasn't hid from him. He knew what was going to happen. See up there in verse 11? For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, ye are not all clean. You're not all clean. Because he had made the statement, I have, you're, you're clean because I've washed you clean, but you're not all clean. In other words, you're saved, talking to his disciples, but not all of you are. Because he knew which one was not. And they were not all clean. And as you go down through here, you'll find out there's some other things that he mentions. And it's so important because I want you to see there in verse 18. He says, I speak not of you all. That word all you ought to underline in a circle. I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen. But that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you, before it come, that when it is come to pass, you may believe that I am he. I want you to believe what I'm saying. I know everything. Jesus is God. And he says, you're not all clean. And there's one among you that's definitely not. He's going to betray me. You say, well, that doesn't mean that he wasn't saved. Well, I'm not through yet either, am I? Don't jump the gun on me. Look now in Matthew 26. Matthew and chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26 and look there in verse 47. Verse 47. And it says there in verse 47, this is on page 1039 in an old school for reference Bible. The Bible that's in there, in the pew there. And that Bible, by the way, in the church pew is exactly like mine. So when I give you a page number, you'll know that's exactly the page that's in that book too. So in verse 47 it says, While he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came and with him a great multitude, with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Hold him fast. Now, is that something? They're going to try to bind the hands of Jesus. Like, I'm going to tie God up. Jesus is God, and we're going to tie God up. Come. If you saw a man who was able to walk on water... Cast out devils, feed 5,000, make the blind to see and the deaf to hear, and raise the dead. If you saw somebody do all that, would you want to mess with them? But nobody said Judas was smart. But this is what was happening. And he was there, he made a deal. He made a deal with the devil. And there was a price to pay. So even down here in verse 50, he says, And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus, and they took him. 
as though they were able to take him with their own power. Do you realize what he could have done to them? Do you realize if that had been me, what I would have done? <laughs> if I saw them coming, I'd have said, I'd double dog dare you. I'd have spit in their eye. I'd have, I'd have slapped their jaws. I'd have gave them a Hawaiian punch. I'd have sent them back into another century. And then I would have, okay, now you can take me. But then that's why I'm not the Lord. Jesus Christ was God, and he knew everything that was going to happen before it takes place. Now, turn in your Bible to chapter 27, Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, and look in verse 3. In verse 3, and it says, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned, and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. In other words, they didn't care. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Now, this is what Judas did. He knew what he had done was wrong. And Dill doesn't say that he ever trusted the Lord. He grieved because of what he had done. He threw the money back. And then he went and hanged himself. And so it says they took this money and they bought a field and that was known even to that day. Now, John chapter 6, the Gospel of John and chapter 6. The Bible says that all that the Father giveth to Christ shall come to him. You see, when we trust Christ as our Savior, we are born of God. God becomes our Father. He fathered us. We are born into his family, born from above. And the Bible tells us that God is going to take all of those who accept that payment that was made for them, born of God, and he's going to give us to the Son. So we are the inheritance for the Son in the book of Psalms chapter 2. So we become his inheritance. This is what he gets. He gets us. And he says, all that the Father giveth to me, shall come to me. And he that cometh to me, I will in no wise ever cast out. Look what he says there in verse 36. But I said unto you, that ye also have seen me, and believe not. So there were people that have been there, they saw him, they walk with him, they talk with him, and still did not believe. Because he's God, he knows who believes and who does not believe. We can fool each other, but we cannot fool God. You can be here this morning, sitting in a Christian church, doing the Christian thing, and still not be saved. That doesn't mean you're going to heaven just because, you know, you read the Bible and you pray and you mean well, you're sincere. If you have not personally accepted Jesus Christ as your only hope of going to heaven, you don't go to heaven. You don't go. You must accept him. You must believe that when he died, he paid for your sins. You see, the reason I don't have to pay for my sins is because I believe he did it for me. So I don't have one sin to pay for. He paid for all of them. From the time I'm born to the time that I die, he died for me. He paid for all of my sins. You don't have to pay for something twice. If Christ paid for all of my sin, there's none left for me to pay. I couldn't go to hell if I tried. I haven't tried. But I can't, I can't go to hell. Because see, my sins are all paid. You say, well, you don't deserve it. I know I don't deserve it. That's why God says, for by grace are you saved. Through faith. That not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works. And yet there's people trying to earn and work their way for something that God says you can't work for. So he makes the statement here in verse 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. And look at what he says in verse 39. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me that of 
all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. So God said, I'll never cast you out. I will never lose you. And then he says up here in verse 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath, present tense, right now, hath everlasting life. And so Christ says, I'll never cast you out. I will never lose you. So why, why is that so important? Well, because of what I'm going to show you. This is all the foundational stuff that you need to see because I want you to understand and believe what God is saying here is so important. Now, look there in chapter 6. You're right there in chapter 6. Now, look up there in verse 64. Verse 64. In verse 64, this is on page 1124. But there are some of you that believe not. Well, how does he know? Well, he wouldn't if he wasn't God. But he's God, and he knows who believes him and who doesn't believe. But he says, some of you that believe not. Get this. For Jesus knew from the what? From the beginning. Who they were that believed not. And who should betray him? You ought to underline that. He knew from the beginning who does not believe and who's going to betray him. He already knows that. And he said, Therefore said I unto you, No man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. In other words, God says he will save all those who come to him. And you can't come to him unless the Father draw you. Well, how does the Father draw you? Christ says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men. So you see, he is lifted up. He makes a payment. And by that message of the gospel, the good news of what Christ did for us so that we can go to heaven, he's going to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature because God wants every person to hear the message because through that gospel message, that good news, God draws you. And here you are and you say, that makes sense to me. I realize I can't save myself and all I have to do is trust Christ as my Savior. I believe He did it for me. That message is the most powerful message in all the world. So He uses that message to draw us to Him. And when He draws us to Him, and we hear it and understand it and believe it, then we are saved. And so that's why Jesus says, no man can come to the Father except the Father draw him. And then those that the Father has, God's going to give those to him. And he says, and I'll never cast you out, and I will never lose you. So it says in verse uh, 66, from that time many of the disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And, get this, where it says, We believe, we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered them, Not so fast, Charlie. Because Jesus asked the dis disciples and Peter, who always speaks up, speaks for everybody, says, we believe. And Jesus said, not so fast. He says in verse 70, have not I chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. He was a devil from the beginning. He was not of God. He did not believe. But you see, the Lord's word, sooner or later, if you read it and you study it, you'll find an answer to a question. The Bible teaches itself. The Bible explains itself. The Bible sheds an awful lot of light on all these commentaries that have been written. Look now in verse 71. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Say, so, well, we finally got that settled. No, 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 not, not, not yet. Well, we're getting close, but it's not totally over yet. Because I believe there's something else that really explains it even more so. Look there in chapter 17 of the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John in chapter 17. 
I believe that this is truly the Lord's prayer. Uh, we often hear about the Lord's prayer, our Father which art in heaven, hell it be thy name. But Jesus never prayed that prayer. Uh, that was just a, a model for us to know how to praise the Lord and ask God for day-by-day -day stuff and forgiving one another and things like that. Uh, it should in contain those ingredients. But the one thing he said is that he despises vain repetition. In other words, just repeating a prayer over and over and over again. I remember for years when I went to bed, for years, I have no clue where I heard it. I know I didn't get it from my mom and dad, but I don't know where I got it. As I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Amen. John Ben shot a rooster, killed a hen, chicken died, and rooster cried, nature satisfied. Now, how many of y'all used to pray that prayer? Or part of it. Maybe not word for word. Hi, I got that last part on that. I ain't got a clue. I don't remember. But I had to be a little tight when I was doing it. But you can, re you can quote, you know, prayers and things like that but never understood. When I gave devotion for some of the high school football teams down in Miami, they would all get together and then huddle, and, uh, you know, before I'd speak. And sometimes they'd do it out in the field, and they'd all get together, and they'd recite the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, and everybody's got their hands on all the football players. They did it. A lot of them did. And so I said, let, let me talk to you about something. All of you got together, and you bowed your head, and you said the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven. I said, did, did you know that it might be possible? Uh, he may not be your father. I said, you, you, he can't be your father unless you're born into his family. I said, let me show you something. And then I would do this little thing that you've never seen before. Let this hand represent you and me. And let the wallet represent sin. We all have sin on us. Now, God says that he loves us. Now, he doesn't like what we do wrong, but he loves us. And to pay for what we do wrong, well, that's eternal separation from the Lord. Sin separates us from God. So since we all sin, we all die, and so sin causes us to be separated from our body. That's why we're all going to die one day. And so the question is, is where, are going, where are you going to be then? What next? Then what? Well, God said that he loves us and wants us to go to heaven. And to go to heaven, we have to be perfect as righteous as God. And we're not. God says because of sin, we can't get in. So what Christ did was something that we could not do. You see, if, if I want to pay for my sins, I have to be eternally separated from God. And God says you can't earn eternal life. You can't work for it. And all your money in the world will never pay for one sin. You realize since you have been living, all of your good works will never take away one sin. Now what are you going to do? This hand represents Jesus Christ. He's the Lord, God in the flesh. Came into the world because he loves us. Hates our sin because it separates us from him. So Jesus Christ, who had no sin, didn't have to die. So he took all the sin of all the world, every person, on himself. And he died for the world. He died for everybody's sin. But he's the one that knows who believes it and who does not believe. So he knows right now at this moment, everyone in this room, if you believe he did it for you or if you don't believe it. Those who believe it, this payment is put to your account. You get to go to heaven. If you don't believe he did it for you, then you don't get to go to heaven. Now, wouldn't it be a shame for you not to go to heaven? When it doesn't cost you anything, there's no gimmicks to it, there's no tricks to it, and all you had to do was believe it. Believe he did it for you. He died to pay for your sins. So this is what Christ did. I've explained that to a lot of the football teams. And I remember one time I gave it for the Denver Broncos, and we had the Baltimore Colts down in Florida. One time we went to one of the little devotions for them. Mel's Carbonell was one of the key individuals back then. This is a powerful message. But some people will believe it, and some people will not believe it. So here in John chapter 17, he said, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. See, 
When you trust Christ as your Savior, then God gives you to the Son, and He gives them eternal life. And He said, I'll never cast you out and never lose you. And verse 3, And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Jesus Christ and God is God. That's why when you have Christ, you have God. And you have the true and living God. He has the Son. It's Jesus Christ. Allah is not God. Allah doesn't have a Son. So we're not talking about the same kind of a God. Don't make a mistake. The Koran is not a holy book. It is a war manual. He said, don't you have respect for other people's religion? No. I don't want you to misunderstand me. No. If God doesn't have respect for it, why should I? He said, this is the truth, this is what you believe, and no man comes unto the Father except through him. There is none other name under heaven given among men. This is the only way. And he says in verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work thou gavest me to do. James just sung that song, paid in full. I've done the work you gave me to do. And then in verse 6 he says, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Now, I believe he's talking about his disciples, and I'll show you why. He said, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee. And get this, you ought to underline this, they have believed that thou didst send me. They believe it. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in thee. Now look in verse 11. Now I am no more in this world, but these are in the world. I am come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me. Those three words you ought to underline. Thou hast given me, hath given me those that believe. You see, that goes all the way back to John chapter 6. And then he says here, Whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Now look in verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost. Those you gave me. Because remember, you go back to John chapter 6. Never cast you out, never lose you. Who? Those that thou hast given to me. And I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. But lotus, I have kept. And none of them is lost but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. There was only one out of the twelve that did not believe. I believe that's Judas Iscariot. I believe when you put all the scriptures together, it goes through and it keeps on until it finally, it answers the question. So go back there to the book of Acts in chapter 1. In verse 24 of Acts chapter 1, and they prayed and says, Thou Lord, which knoweth the hearts of all men, show whether are these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. Now, I don't believe that's the same place that you and I are going to go because we've trusted Christ as our Savior. But he noticed Judas had every opportunity. He saw the Lord. He walked with the Lord. He talked with the Lord. He was able even to produce miracles and so forth. 
And remember, there's a scripture that says, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, cast out devils, and done many wonderful works? And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. It means they never believed. So is it possible for people today to be very, very religious and go to church and do all these right things and hear all the right stuff and never themselves ever personally ever trust Christ as their Savior? I believe that it's possible. I believe a lot of people have. For example, we had a service just Thursday night. And as I gave the gospel... And then I gave an invitation. I could sense the Lord working. And it's a strange thing because you can't always explain it. But when you see a lot of people believe in it, so I, I believe that. See, raising your hand will not save you. I've never told anybody, raise your hand and it'll save you. Walk in an aisle will not save you. Praying through and hanging on, letting go and letting God ain't going to save you. The only thing that saves you is you in your own heart believing that what Christ did was for you. And you trusting him. Now the Lord, he didn't even have to ask for a raise of hands. Why? Because he's the Lord. He knows who believes without asking. I don't have that ability. So what I do is I ask. For example, if you're here this morning and let's say while I'm talking, you're sitting there and you're saying, you know, that made sense to me. I'm going to trust Christ as my Savior. I believe he died and paid for my sins. Because you don't have to pay for something twice. So if you believe he did it for you, he puts the payment to your account. He gives you eternal life and you get to go to heaven whenever you die. So you may sit here and trust Christ as your Savior. And I'll never know it. Why do you think I've done all this talking? Because I want you to trust the Lord. Well, wouldn't it be gratifying to know if somebody does? So whenever I ask people to bow their heads and close your eyes so that nobody's embarrassed, when I ask a person to raise their hand, it's not for you to be saved. It's because I believe that you believe it. And you're trusting Christ as your Savior. And I just want to know. Is it wrong for me to want to know? I have been preaching for it for 45 minutes. It's like dangling a, a T-bone steak in front of a Rottweiler. Do you want it? Do you want it? Do you want it? Well, buddy, if he takes it, you'll know it. And I believe if you take it, I want, I want to know why. Because that's why I do it. It brings great joy. And... I'd like to have prayer for you. And I'd like to welcome you into the family of God. Because, see, when I trusted Christ as my Savior, I became God's child. Well, if you trust Christ as your Savior, then you become God's child. So both of us are God's children. Hey, welcome to the family. The family of God. Ain't no better family than that. And one day we're going to all die here and we're going to go to heaven and we're going to have a big reunion up there. I'm kind of looking forward to that. So very quickly, you and me, sin. Christ, no sin. Loves us, hates sin. Took it, paid for it. Came back from the dead. You believe it, you get to go to heaven. Not because of anything you've done, but because of what he did for you. Will you believe it? Let's pray, shall we? Every head bowed and every eye closed. As we went through some of these scriptures, you saw where it says, some believed, some believed not. You may be here this morning and some believe and some believe not. God does not make you believe it. See, he already knows I don't. I'm just a man. I can't save you. This church can't save you. All the money in the world can't save you.
But if you will trust Jesus Christ right now as your Savior, God said he would save you and give you eternal life. Friend, I pray that you will. So with heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around, I'm going to ask you in just a moment to raise your hand. Raising your hand does not save you. It just lets me know that you believe he did it for you. And it's your way of saying, preacher, I believe it. I'm trusting Christ as my Savior, and I want you to know. Would you just slip your hand up very quickly and put it right back down? Yes, God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, ma'am. Anyone else? Very quickly, just slip it up. God bless you. God bless you in the back. I see your hand. You can put it down. God bless you, ma'am. You see, it's a sign of good judgment. There's no tricks to it. I'm not going to have you stand there but come forward. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. Anyone else before we close? Say, preacher, that made sense to me, and I want to trust Christ as my Savior. I want to be certain of going to heaven. Anyone else? Our Father, we thank you so much for all you've done for us. We're thankful for the opportunity to share the gospel with others. There's so many people that's never heard. And I just thank you, Lord, for those who indicated this morning by an uplifted hand that by faith they trust Christ as their Savior. And by doing so, Lord, we know according to your word they become your child, your child forever, that you'll never cast them out and never lose them. We ask your blessings, Lord, upon each family here and all the hard work of all those that brought the food so that we could have a good time of fellowship. We ask your blessings upon the food and to use it for the nourishment of our bodies. And we thank you, Father, for those that are visiting with us today and we pray your special blessing upon them.